I'm gonna basically just going to be talking a little bit about a project which I've built over the last um, couple of years that happens to be open source hardware and happens to be used in some quite interesting places. So you can see it in front of you. That's definitely not what it started as, though. Um, you know, like most electronics projects, this was um, you know, just a, a glimmer in my eye. So a long time ago in this context is, is four years, which is probably not that much in the context of th some things going on here. Um, and far, far away was 20 minutes down the road that way. Um, but it was a competition that my teacher introduced me to, and she was like, well, this seems like it might be your kind of thing. Why don't you give it a shot? So, you know, I got together with a friend, and we basically got to the point where we are like, well, we've got a Raspberry Pi now. You know, we've managed to turn it on, put an SD card. What, what should we build? So, you know, we tried to capitalize upon the different things that made the Pi what it is. So it's kind of, it's internet connectivity-ness. It's super portability. It's, um, you know, a GPIO connector so that you could actually, you know, do hardware things, not just software things. Um, and also, you know, it's low power. So, you know, we went online, we found a bunch of sensors, we wired them up. It wasn't like, you know, super crazy stuff. Um, and we built some software as well. And, you know, it kind of looked like that to start with. Um, you know, as, as yeah, most electronics projects, just a kind of hairy mess of breadboard. Um, and it measured air quality, temperature, humidity, standard weathery things. Um, we, um, yeah, yeah inter internet as well. Um, so we, we ended up winning the competition that we submitted it to. But the competition actually was unique in that it kind of forced us, part of the entry requirements were put some instructions online. So I guess that's kind of like the, the very like lowest level of open source. You know, we published our code and we put some instructions online. You know, we hadn't tried uh, at all to develop a community around it. But someone somehow stumbled across these instructions and actually took it upon himself to build one. So this is the very first AirPi built not by me. Um, and it was used to check if the light in his fridge went off when he closed the door. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this was you know, incredibly inspiring to see. Um, but it was still a bit of a pain because people had to wire it up manually. You know, cables here, there, whatever it happened to be. Um, there was no uh, circuit board until um, yeah, so some guy, we, we had a contact us form online, and some guy was just like, you know, I design PCBs for a living for like, you know, NASA, NASA, whatever, in, in America. Um, do you mind if I design a circuit board for you? And at that point, I had no idea how to design a circuit board. So I was like, well, yes, definitely, please go ahead. I'm not going to stop you. Um, so, you know, a couple of, a couple of months later, we we'd hopped on Osh Park, ordered ourselves a circuit board, and we went from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, um, which is a fair improvement. And it also allowed us to produce some, you know, little <coughs> electronics kits or whatever. So, you know, we made 20 kits, which was 20 more than I'd built beforehand. Um, we sold them out, or we sold out on, or in, in one day at the Maker Faire. Um, and we were featured br very briefly on the front page of Wired. Um, the website, not the magazine, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> um, but we were getting a lot of requests from people who weren't obviously at the Maker Faire in person to buy one of these things. So we set up a crowdfunding campaign, um, as, as is the hip thing to do for all startups nowadays. Um, you know. So we set ourselves a moderate goal of like you know, 50 kits or so. Um, and our pre-orders kind of looked like this. Um, you know. It was like, you might be able to tell what's going to happen because of the axes, but you know. Um, so <laughs> we got featured in the Raspberry Pi blog. <laughs> And that happened. So yeah, that was, that was quite happy. Um, you know, quite pleasing. Um, so then, then came obviously the, the like secondary issue, which was how on earth do I make and ship 250, 300 of these, uh, of these things. Um, and so it was basically, you know, hey, friends, you need jobs, right? Come, I'll, I'll pay you in pizza and you know, tenner an hour, and you will, you'll put things in components in boxes for me. So, you know, um, they actually, I think that's probably the happiest they looked all day, probably didn't tell them to smile, I promise. <laughs> um, and another question which I get asked a lot is, so this is, you know, we ship, et cetera, et cetera. This is kind of on to more what it does. So is, is it actually useful from an air quality perspective? Because the sensors on this thing cost about $5 rather than, you know, $5,000 that might be on, you know, something uh, commissioned by the government to sit on the side of a street and measure air quality 24-7. Um, 
And I guess for a while my answer was, I don't know, probably. Um, and, but then I just, I chucked one of them on my bike for a while. Um, and, you know, in the space of one day, I I'd basically cycled around a lot and then mapped, uh, mapped it because I had GPS as well. So I'm not quite sure if you can kind of see, but there's a bunch of dots going on here and down here. Um, red dots are bad air quality, or lower at least, not necessarily bad. Um, and green dots are better, as in you know, so less pollutants. Um, and uh, this was like, you know, a main road, hundreds of cars or whatever. And this was this tiny, you know, side street. And the fact of the matter was, you know, within a, the space of about five minutes, uh, sorry, five meters of going off the main road, the air quality had dropped off like dramatically, you know, to the point where we could actually detect it, even with our cheap $5 sensor. So yes, for some things it's useful. It's not, for, it's not good at absolute measurements, you know. You can't buy two of these things and say, air quality better here than there, but you can say the air quality is better than it was yesterday, that kind of thing. Um, so the cool thing about this photo is not the fact that it's circuit boards, it's the fact that I never actually produced any white circuit boards. I had put all of the software and the hardware uh, you know, uh, circuit board designs online, and when I went to uni, I kind of abandoned the project because I had no free time to do that kind of thing. Um, but because it was all open source, a kind of community grew up around it, and people actually started making their own circuit boards um, and selling them online. Um, and I thought that that was quite cool. Um, you know, uh, the f and this was, this was definitely not an isolated incident. There were plenty of people both working on the hardware and the software um, for this project. Um, for example, on our, the of official, as in my GitHub uh, repo for the project has like 50 commits by me or something, but there's a, there's a very popular fork that has over 300 commits in total. So open source software kind of, you know, ruled the day there. Even when I didn't have time to work on software, you know, other people were there to help improve it. Um, and then, so yeah, different, different things that it can be used for and has been used for. So I guess this is kind of where this all ties into the open source in unusual places. Um, we shipped out three to Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. Um, that was quite cool. Um, and then we had, you know, simple things like, you know, even small businesses, you know, where a professional monitoring solution is going to cost you a lot of money. Um, you know, some guy chucked an AirPi in his server room, you know, and I was like, okay, this is the end of it, right? You know, he measured loads of stuff and the temperature was stable forever. But then, like, a year later or something, I get a message from the same guy saying, I woke up this morning and I'd got an email from, you know, this web service or whatever telling me that the temperature had just, you know, exceeded recommended limits. And it turns out they were working on, you know, the air conditioning in our server building room thing yesterday and they've got to turn it back on once they've finished. So, you know, I, I don't know if I'd saved, but I potentially saved <laughs> a lot of money in terms <coughs> of um, service there. Um, so, also another thing which I just didn't even realize it was a thing beforehand. Um, if you're an archivist, you're looking after you know, the health of loads of books and documents, stuff like that. Um, you want to make sure that they're not too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry. Um, so you've got to maintain all of this kind of stuff. The current way that it was done, at least in the place where, where, which I was chatting to, which is the library in my school, was you know, we'll buy these little gadgets that just sit, sit in the display case or whatever. And we'll walk around physically, you know, and there might have been 20 of these across the whole, whole campus. We'll walk around each week taking, and then the, the, the gadget will display, you know, high temperature, low temperature, average temperature for the past week, and we'll just check that that's all in order, you know. So having something like this that just does it, you know, on the fly, you know, you can just log on and see what it was five minutes ago. So much easier, so much time saved. Um, and then, I don't know if this actually got anywhere because some guy, uh, some business actually in India was like, we want to use these to monitor temperature. And I was like, you can if you want, but I'm not supporting that. <laughs> um, you know, it's a bit, a bit of a long distance away from my perspective. Um, so other uses were kind of like um, teaching, basically. I thought it was a really cool one. So I offered um, educational discounts on the kits. Um, and uh, the Chaos Computer Club uh, bought 30 of them and used them to teach a soldering club to kids, which was, I thought was really cool. Um, and then another one, which I don't know if I'm allowed to say this here, but um, 
I was looking at the referrers to our website and, <laughs> and, and I was getting a lot of <laughs> referrals from, from you know, these sort of like slightly sketchy forums in, in the nether ends of the internet um, dedicated to, um, you know, uh, marijuana cultivation <laughs> and it turns out you need all of this kind of detailed information and you know if you're running you know a low budget operation um, <laughs> maybe 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 this 50 pound device is for you so you know um, yeah I, this is how I justify it right you know it's like well I'm not supporting illegal activities they're just all based in one city and yeah <laughs> but by far the coolest one that I that I got was um, and this, and this is where I guess I stop and ask for questions, was this guy who was basically like, we're looking to make it shockproof and send it up a tornado in Tornado Alley in the <laughs> USA. <laughs> and if that isn't somewhere I didn't expect to see open source hardware, then I don't know. <laughs> so that's all I have to say. Um, bring on the beer. <laughs>